Hi, my name is David Barreto, and today I'm going to be talking about digital signatures. I'm going to be explaining what the problem is, uh, a general solution, and also I'm going to show you an implementation written in Rust. So let's start first by defining what the problem is. When you want to send money to a person or an institution, you can, for example, use a check. And in a check, you're going to define not only things like the date and the amount, and the person you're going to send the money to, but also you're going to put your own signature. And the signature is, is a way for a bank or someone else to authenticate or to validate that it was actually you who wanted to make that transaction or to send that money. So in this case, John, it's, it's like a, he says, okay, I, John, agreed to send this money to Peter, and here's my signature. Here's the proof that it was actually me who agreed to send this money. But as you know, uh, anyone else can actually grab one of these blank checks and then just put whatever amount they want and forge your signature, right? Your signature might be very simple, easy to, to replicate. So in this case, it's susceptible for this kind of fraud. Of course, a bank these days is going to ask you for an additional piece of ID, let's say your driver's license or your bank card. But uh, this is just a signal that the signature itself is not enough to uniquely authenticate someone, to, to verify that is, that is the actual origin of the transaction. In, in Bitcoin, we have a similar problem because in Bitcoin, we have different people trying to, uh, to start transactions, right? To send money to each other. In this case, for example, John, he posts a transaction to the network, say, I, John, agreed to send 0 0.5 Bitcoin to Bob. And Bob could do something similar to send money to Peter. Say, I, Bob, agreed to send this amount of Bitcoin to Peter. Peter does the same. But just notice that it, they always try to prove that it's actually them, just by saying, me, Peter, me, John. Uh, but this on itself is obviously not enough because that's not stopping anyone from trying to say, trying to impersonate someone else and say, I, John, agreed to send all my Bitcoin to a hacker, right? So this is why digital signatures uh, came to be, or one of the applications, it has many applications, but it's it's widely used in in many blockchains, uh, not only on Bitcoin, but also in Ethereum that I know of, and probably many, if not all of them, use this process. So uh, to do digital signature, it's important then to talk about private and public keys. And this private and public keys, um, are used for two purposes, mainly. One is for encryption and one is for digital signatures. The way it works is that every user, they will have to generate a, a unique private key. And this private key is normally like a random number. In the case of Bitcoin, it's a random number that is 256 bit or 32 bytes. Um, and from the private key, we're gonna generate a second key that is a public key. These two keys are related, so you can only d derive one public key for, from one private key. And it's created in a way that even if, the, even if you know the public key, it's impossible to guess what was the private key associated with. So you have this cryptographic guarantee with a, with a one-way function. So the way to use these two keys for encryption, which by the way, it's not used this way for Bitcoin, but it's a general usage that you're going to see in the internet, for example is that, that every user, they're going to generate their own pair of private and public key. Always keep in mind that the public key is always derived from the private key. So these two things are related and it's impossible to guess what the private key was just by knowing the public key. The private key has to remain always secret that you never share with anyone, but the public key as the name implies is public. So if you want to encrypt a message uh, and for example, if, if John and Bob, they want to send messages to, to each other, over an insecure network where anyone else could be eavesdropping. So the first thing they do is to exchange their public key with each other. So John is gonna send to Bob his public key and Bob is gonna send to John his public key, right? So now each of them has the, the other's public key. So now John is gonna, is gonna try to en encode this secret message and to do that, it's going to use uh, a cryptographic en encryption function. Uh, in this case, it's going to use the public key and it's going to use the message itself, pass it to this function. 
And what he gets out is the encrypted message, right? So now he can safely send this message over an unsecure network over to Bob. And then when Bob receives this encrypted message, he now can use uh, his own private key with the encrypted message, pass it to a decrypt function. And what he gets out is the actual uh, plain message. So keep in mind, this works because we use Bob's public key for the encryption, and then we use Bob's private key for the decryption. And these two keys are related. So how it, this is how, at a very high level, how the algorithm works. Now, the second uh, usage of this uh, pair of keys is, as I mentioned before, the digital signature. So let's go back to the initial state, right? When each one of them have uh, these two keys and they exchange with each other the public key. So now what John wants to do is to be able to create a message, right? And the message by itself is going to be, it's going to be public, right? When he sends, when he sends it over the network, anyone can actually read it. And this is how Bitcoin works. Every transaction is open for anyone who wants to see. There's no encryption associated with it. But he's going to add not only the message, but a signature of the message using his private key. And the idea is that anyone who reads the, the message and the signature will be able to identify if John, in fact, was the author of the message. The same way that we a signature in a check will authenticate you in some capacity. So to do this, to do this uh, John is going to take the private key and the public message. It's going to pass it through a, a sign uh, function. And the function is going to give you back the signature of this particular message. So now John's going to send both things to Bob, the public message and the uh, signature. And what Bob wants to verify if, if John was actually the author. To do that, he's going to pass uh, these three things to a verify function. So he's he's going to use the, the actual message. He's going to use John's public key and the signature of that message in particular, right? And now these functions is going to tell you pretty much true or false if this signature is in fact correlated with the private key that John has, right? Again, this works because the public key and the private key, they're both related uh, mathematically. So this function in this case, uh, yes, true. John was actually the author of this message because this signature uh, corresponds to the public key of, of John. Let me now uh, show you an implementation of this process in Rust. Okay, now that we have our console uh, open, uh, I'm going to be using Rust. I'm, I'm not going to explain how to install Rust. You can go check it out the, the website. They explain very well. Just follow the steps. So I'm going to assume that you have Rust installed. So I'm just going to create a new project using Cargo. And by the way, I'm using Rust for this example. It's because this this is the actual purpose why this language was created. It, this is a systems language that it's comparable to C in terms of, of performance, uh, but extra memory or, or safety uh, about how memory is being used, which is one of, one of the common pitfalls about C++. Uh, and it's also used for one of the clients for Ethereum. So in a way, it's been proven that it's, it's a good fit for blockchain technologies. So, okay, I'm going to create the, the new project. Just give me a second, just take a look at my notes here. Uh, all right. So we're going to use cargo. So you say cargo new, we're going to call this project uh, digital signature. Okay, let's go. And then cargo goes and creates a new folder that is called digital signature. So we go into that folder. And now we can open this in uh, VS Code or in any IDE that you have. Okay, uh, as you can see, uh, Cargo created a source folder, uh, git ignore, and a cargo.tunnel. Uh, actually, I don't know how to pronounce this file. Uh, well, alongside the target and uh, git ignore. Cool, this cargo.tunnel uh, is similar to a package.json in JavaScript. And if we look at our the only Rust file, this main, uh, this your your the body of your code needs to be wrapped in inside of a main function. 
So let's now open the, the terminal here. And just to verify that it works, you can say to a cargo run. And this will try to compile. And yes, we can see here the hello world that we see here, right? Okay, cool. So we say that in, in the previous example that for every person, you need to have a, a private and a public key, right? And, and that the private key is gonna get a randomly generated and then the public key is derived from it. So let's start the first step is, let's create a structure or a struct uh, of type person that is, is gonna have these two fields, public and private key. So I can go here uh, above it and just say struct person and define the private key and then the public key. All right. We have to now define the types of these uh, these properties um, and also because we're going to be doing a lot of uh, use some cryptographic functions we need to use a special library because it, this is not included in the in the preload or in, in the default set of functions that rust provide and the library that i or, or the crate that i selected is called k256 uh, and i chose that one mostly because it was it was popular it was well documented and, and seemed to be actively maintained so if you go to crates.io and search for K256, so this is the one that we're gonna be using, right? And you can see this is the way that we can add the dependency on our project. I'm just gonna head copy this line and go back to my code and we can go to cargo here in the, in the dependency section, we can just add this line and that's gonna bring uh, the library into our project. So let me for now just comment out these two fields because otherwise the compiler is gonna complain about this properties not having a type. And we can run cargo build just to bring all the dependencies. So you can see it just downloaded anything that is required from this, from this crate because this crate has also its own dependencies and it's also gonna try to compile and it compiles, but it has a, a warning, right? Because we're not using this for, for anything yet. Okay, so let's go back. And first of all, let's start with the private key, right? So if we look at the library, the documentation, you can see here, let's see, uh, we're gonna be using the elliptic curves digital signature algorithm, the ECDSA, right? Uh, and we have here a simple example doing something similar to what we want to do. Uh, so let me see, let me look at my nodes. All right, so we need to have, first of all, we need to enable this uh, feature in, in our project because in order to save a space, the create K256 node, it doesn't provide by default this, this feature. So we need to enable that. And to enable it, we're gonna have to go to back to the toml file. And there's a slightly different syntax for defending dependencies. We can use this kind of object type thingy. So in here we define, okay, this is gonna be the version. And then we define what optional features we want to enable. So we're gonna enable the ECDSA. But as you can see, it says to use it, you will need to enable one of the two following cargo features. And we need this, this one and not that one because we're looking for the for these two types, the signing key and the verify key, which are gonna be the type for the public key and sorry, for the private key and the public key respectively. So, okay, so we're gonna add here ECDSA and then we can go back to main. So as I mentioned, this the type of this, uh, let me first bring from, from the crate those types. So we can use uh, use, uh, use K256, ECDSA, and then here we have signing key and we have verify key. So we need both, right? For the private and public. So we can use the syntax to bring both um, verify. Sometimes the other complete doesn't work, but I know it's this is name verifying verify key. Uh, let me check. Verify key. All right. 
So we have the types into scope. So now I can define it here. So the private key is going to have type signing key, which is actually another struct. And for the public key, we're going to have the verify key. Okay. And this is complaining because we need a semicolon at the end. Uh, let's see. Is this enough? No, we need a semicolon here. Sorry, not here. Right. This, the semicolon de defined uh, statements. And when, when there's no semicolon, it defines an expression, something that returns a value. Okay. So we have finally the struct defined and we can start to use it. So we can create a new, new person. Uh, let me check my notes for a moment. Right. Uh, we need to create first, actually, uh, kind of like a stat static method or, or an associated function, as they call it, to create a new instance of this struct. And the reason to do it that way and not to use the struct directly is because we need to use some special functions to create those keys whenever we create a new, a new person. Uh, so in Rust, to create this associated function, we use the, this keyword and we apply it to a person. So whatever we define here, they're going to be either associated function or as we call it in the OOP, static methods or regular struct methods. So in this case, we're going to create the, this kind of like factory uh, function, which when you call it, it's going to return you an instance of, of this person struct. Okay. So now let's start by first creating the private key and the private key is going to be created by using this, the same struct, the signing key. And we're going to use the function or the method random, right? Because as I mentioned, a private key is nothing more than just a random number, but it needs to be a truly random number because if it's a weak random number, it's, it's easy to, to guess for a computer at least. So the strongest, um, a uh, random number generator, which is what this RNG means, is going to be the one provided by the underlying OS. And if we look at the documentation, we can see that this is where it's defined. The OS random number generator is defined in the library run core. So we need to import now this crate as well into our project to be able to bring this struct or this type. Uh, so let's go to crates.io again, and let's search for, what's the name again? Run, run core. Okay. So we have it here and this is the way to bring it into the project. We're going to copy and we're going to put in the cargo. And one thing to keep in mind is that notice that it says it requires the get random feature. So in order to have in order to be able to import or to bring into scope this, this struct is to enable this feature in this uh, library. So we're going to do a similar trick as we did with um, K256. We're going to switch the syntax. So this is the version, sorry, the version, then the features, um, it's an array and it has the value get random. That's the feature we want to enable. Let's bring it some space here as before. Okay, let's verify, go back to here to main. And if this is working, we can now import that random number generator from uh, run core and OS RNG. Okay, so that's the one that we're going to be using here. OS RNG. Great. We have the private key. Now that we have the private key, which is random, we're going to derive the public key from it. So now let public key, it's equal to, so if you go to uh, private key, let me check my nodes, right. So we're going to use another function that is coming from this structure. So we're going to call verify key and it's called from. So what this requires is uh, basically a reference to a private key. And it's going to give you back the related public key. And actually the number here is not private. It's public key, public key. Okay. That makes more sense. Let's remove this and provide the private key. 
But by the way, we don't want to pass the value as is because um, this is going to provide ownership of the variable instead of the method or the function. So we got, want to provide only a reference. So the scope remains uh, this, this method outside. All right, so now we have both properties private and public. So we can now create the struct. So it's a person is going to have a private key and a public key. And this is a shortcut that you don't have to define private key is equal to private key. Uh, it assumes that the property is named as the same as the variable that is in the scope. And because I don't define here a semicolon, this is an expression. So it's going to return this value and it's exactly what the, the function is expecting or the associated function is expecting to be returned. So that's why we don't see any error. Great. Um, so now we can actually create instances of this struct. So we can say, uh, let's create a new property, a new variable called, let's say, John, as the example before. And we're going to say, okay, person, let's use the new factory method. And that's it. We have now uh, a person that has a public key, a private key and a public key, and those two are related. The next step is we need to define a method to sign messages. Uh, so this is going to be an actual method not uh, an associated function. So in this case, we're going to call it, we're going to call it a uh, sign message, sign message, right? And the return value of this sign message is going to be of type signature. And this is all coming from the documentation of the, of the crate. And so for signing a message, if you recall from the slides, we need, uh, basically two things. We need the message and we need the public key, sorry, the private key of the person. We have the private key, right? Because it's going to be part of the struct itself. And, and because this is a real method, the very first uh, parameter of this method is going to be self, right? A reference to the actual instance. And then we need to have the message, the thing that we want to, to add a signature to. And the type of this, and this is a little, let's say, uh, surprising because normally you will define this to be a type string, or this is like a, an immutable borrow of, uh, of a string. But as you can see, let me see the, if we try to use the, the method that does the signature, right? That method lives uh, inside of the private key and it's called sign. And as you can see, it expects a message, but the type of the message is actually a reference to an array of uh, unsigned uh, integers of eight bits. It's not really a reference or a, or a string slice. So this, this is the way that it works. So we can actually modify this. I'm just gonna modify now to match the signature of this method. I'm going to show you how to create a string that is actually stored uh, as an array of, of bytes instead of being stored as a UTF-8, which sometimes use multiple bytes depending on the character. The only limitation is that now our message will need to be uh, only ASCII characters. We cannot use anything that is outside of the regular ASCII table. Uh, we actually, we don't put the semicolon because we want to return this. But we have some errors. First of all, the name is the name is message, not MSG. And second of all, it's complaining that it's not able to find the this method, right? And that's because we need to bring into scope the trait that implements uh, that method. And that trait is actually in it's inside of this library, inside of this module. And it's called, it's called, um, signature, signature signer. Let me check, let me check something here. Da, 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 signing key. Oh, okay. Looking at the documentation, we can see they have a similar example, right? They have this message here. Uh, it says we have, it contains support for computing ECDSA signatures using either one of these two algorithms, the SHA-256 or Keka-256. This is the algorithm used in Bitcoin. It actually is the most widely used. This is the one used in Ethereum that I know of. I think it's the only one. 
But in order to use either one of those, we need to now enable those features into the crate, right? So the same way that we did before with the ECDS, now we need to enable this feature as well in this library. So we can go back to our cargo.toml and say, okay, I want this feature, but I also want this SHA-256 feature so I can do uh, actual signatures. Uh, all right. So now we can import the, the trait that implements this method. And that one is use K256. It's also within this module, ECDSA. But now we have to go, it's called signing, signing key, I think. Wait, signing key, now that's the one that we have before. It's called signature. Signature and then signer, signer, oh, signer. All right, that's the trait that implements this method into this struct, right? So that's why you can see that the, the error is gone. We have now a new issue here. Okay, uh, we cannot find type signature in this scope. We don't have signature here. And signature also lives uh, within this module. So it lives here, signature. We can combine these two use into, into a one uh, a one sentence, um, one statement. And the way to do it is just here at the very end, I can just say, right, signature, signer, right? And I can remove this one here. Okay, cool. So I have everything uh, in scope. Um, perfect. So this is working fine. This is all the fine, no errors. So now I'm able to actually sign a message. So let's give it a try. Let's create a new message, right? And I'm gonna see, uh, I'm John, right? And as I mentioned, by, by default, this string is gonna be stored as an UTF-8, but we actually need something that is an array of, of bytes. So to force it to be stored that way, we can prefix with a B, and it's gonna tell Rust, okay, this is actually stored as just pure bytes, uh, and if you see, if you can, if you try to add any other character that is not ASCII, uh, like like this, it's gonna complain and say, "Hey, by constant must only be ASCII characters, right?" And this is not. This is a Unicode character. All right. Now we can actually use this sign message. So we can say John dot sign message, and we pass the message. And what we get back is the signature. Signature, right? Perfect. So we have the, the, the signing process done. Now we need to define a function to verify if that signature corresponds to this message and to John itself, to his private key. This is not going to be a method from the struct. It's just going to be a, a plain on function. So let's going to call it here. Mm -hmm. Right, verify signature, that's the name. And this function is not gonna return anything, it's just gonna print uh, is valid or is invalid based on, on the, this information that we provide. So the things that we need here to verify the signature are, first of all, we need the, the message, right? If you recall from the slide, we need the message, we need the signature and we need the public key. Uh, and the message type, we know it's uh, immutable reference to bytes. And then we have, we need the, the signature, signature. And we need the type is signature, right? We, we know it, we see it right here. We, and we, we need it is as a reference. We don't want to take ownership. This is one of the things that is very unique to Rust, uh, the, the ownership model. And we need the public key, John's public key. Yeah, so the public key and the type of this is gonna be verify key, I believe. Yeah. And again, we don't want to take ownership of the variable. We only want uh, to borrow an immutable reference or, or borrow it. We want to just borrow the variable, not to own it. Cool, we have the three things required. So now we can use uh, 
the function, a method defined inside of the public key. So we say public key dot uh, verify, right? And verify requires uh, the message and the signature. So we're gonna pass here the message and we're gonna pass the signature. And now it complains because we don't have, we need to import the, the trait that implements this method in the struct, in the public key, in the verify key struct. And that one is defined here. So we have one for signer and we have one for verifier. There you go. Let's see, uh, okay, so the error is gone, perfect. Cool, so now we have the result. Now here we're gonna know if it's true or false that that message uh, has that signature and the signature corresponds to the private key related to the public key that is in past. The type of this variable is result. And in, in Rust, this result is a type, but at the same time it's an enum. Uh, and it has two possible values. So to verify which value it is, we're gonna use match. It's kind of like a switch statement uh, result. And then we say, uh, give me a second, right, result. And we say, okay, so it could be either, okay, this is one of the types of the enum. Uh, in that case, we're gonna print the string. Uh, the signature is valid. Let's put it in an uppercase valid. And otherwise, if it's an error, that's right, the other type of the enum. Uh, we're going to print, by the way, this exclamation mark is, uh, it defined that it's a macro. Uh, the signature is invalid, All right? Uh, these two types of the enum, they also are going to pass you a value, but I am not care really about the value that is being passed. So I'm just going to ignore it using this simple, uh, under case. And that's it. So let's let's use it. I'm gonna now here use um, verify signature, and we're gonna pass, of course, the message. We're gonna pass the signature. Uh, yeah, signature, but just a reference to it. Okay, and the public key, which is gonna be in this case instead of a, it's a John. Jump all the key. And we're gonna pass, once again, just a reference. So we're just gonna borrow these variables. Let's see, if, if it's all working fine, what we should see uh, on our console is uh, the signature is valid. Let's give it a try, let's do cargo, let's clear here for a moment. And cargo run. So it's installing all these extra dependencies because we enabled some features. Um, and we can see, yeah, the signature is valid. So great, it was able to kind of authenticate the author. So let's try to fool the system and let's create now Bob. Bob is gonna try to fool us into thinking that this message was actually sent by Bob, right? So let's say person, new, person, new. So Bob has his, its own pair of public and private key. And of course, because the private key is private, Bob doesn't know which one is it. So Bob is gonna use his own uh, private key. But he's gonna try to impersonate Bob by saying, hey, I'm Bob in the message, right? Sorry, hey, I'm John. It's actually Bob doing that. He's gonna try to trick us. And because we know every public key, we, and we don't know that Bob is, is trying to fool us into thinking that he was John, we're just gonna leave it the same way and see what happens. So cargo run, and you can see that the signature is invalid. So now we know that that message was not signed by John. We don't know we don't know who, but we know for sure that it's not John. Of course, if we switch this to use, instead of John's public key, we use Bob public key, we will know that the author of the message was actually Bob, not John, right? The signature is valid. Um, Okay, so that completes the, this uh, small tutorial about digital signatures. 
And I think for the next video, I'm going to explore uh, transactions in Bitcoin. See you later.